Chapter 24, Thank Heaven A Japanese clad only in a lava lava with a white sarong around his head gripped the rudder, I gasped up at his inquiring face and shouted, Will you take me to Cooktown? I have no money, no matter, any more men's. Yes, there is another man on the island, but he will not come away. The Japanese nodded to the dinghy crew and then commenced to struggle to force the tiny craft back through the rollers, breaking on the reef. One Japanese and two strong aboriginals labored at the oars, another Japanese crouched, shouting directions from the bow. The strain told in the knotted throats of the oarsmen, as with gritted teeth they pulled the dinghy back foot by foot towards the edge of the reef. <clears throat> The great reef that bound the island in mighty ramparts and whose every mood I knew so well. It seemed fiendishly determined now to hold us to the island. The suspense was pretty awful. Staring at the crouching bow man wondering whether he could unerringly signal the rowers the exact moment to strain out over the edge of the reef. He did it, picked the right waves, and the dinghy battled through. We had hardly slipped through when the falling waves came rolling to crash upon the reef. Highly trained seamanship, a job like that. It was pitch dark when we plunged over the reef and among the now huge rollers of the deeper water. Each time the dinghy rose to a wave top, we saw a dancing masthead light as the lugger sailed in short tacks back along the channel. She was experiencing a difficult task in picking us up. An hour's hard maneuvering brought the bouncing dinghy right alongside the lugger. As she rose on the crest of a wave, brown hands reached down, and I was suddenly sprawled on the deck with the dinghy, my arms around a turtle that was roped helplessly to the deck. As the lugger reeled away into the trough of the sea, I scrambled up with singing heart. Goodbye to the island at last. What splendid seamen. Soon afterwards, two hoarse-voiced commands. The sails came tumbling down. The anchor splashed down to the rattle of, a, of the chain. In calmer water, we lay beside the lugger's mates under the shelter of little Cookay. Cheery talk broke out as... All was made snug for the night. A fire was quickly lighted in the galley. Cooking pots were soon bubbling. A hurricane lamp was lashed to the base of the mainmast, and it swayed there, a wee faint light. The masthead lights of the other luggers blinked like misty stars. The black boy crew rolled on the slippery deck in uncontrollable laughter, the whites of their eyes and teeth gleaming in the swaying lamplight. Apparently my general nakedness and rags caused the merriment, but it really was the fish spear. Lying against a coil of rope, laughingly, I threw the spear overboard, and immediately regretted it. The crude weapon had been a friend indeed. The Japanese captain smilingly produced a clean plate, knife, and fork, and a pannikin. You hungry? I've eaten only fish and crabs and latterly potatoes for months. He nodded and opened a tin of meat while a grinning black boy came along with a steaming billy of tea. The smell of it brought back civilization and a ravenous hunger. Sugar belonga him. I nodded and he tipped in a big spoonful. The captain poured a thick helping of condensed milk into the billy can and placed beside it a well-browned sea damper. Meat and tea and sugar, rice and damper and jam, trying to laugh away the effort to wait. I thanked him. This is heaven. I understand not quite, replied the captain amiably. Very hungry though you are, sure I am. Sit down and plenty eat of much. There is more will come. We ate immediately, and my word, men can eat after a hard day's work at sea. That was a grand dinner. The crew's meal took a little longer to cook, and by the time it was ready, they laughingly put the billy on again for me. I eased over so as to sprawl more comfortably on the deck, 
then by the dancing rays of the hurricane lamp took stock of my shipmates. Six Japanese sat round a dish of curried fish and rice, while in the bows eight aboriginal seamen ate boisterously, all clothed in the simple lava lava of the barrier seas. The big helpless turtle, its head moving to the right and left, its little bright eyes queerly hopeless, two bobbing masthead lights nearby, the black shadow of Koke Island right against us, and high up over the mast, little Koke blinking brightly. She had always seemed so elusive and far away, now she was brilliant and flashed more decisively. How the mind of man has developed when he can set upon the sea a light that all unattended for six or twelve months at a time flashes out when sunset comes and goes to sleep at sunrise. The wind was now whining through the halyards, but even that cold wind could not blow away the smell of the lugger with its queer tang of eastern foods. Back in the darkness was a growing thunder as seas rolled pounding on the reef. Away from that island, thank heaven at last, the captain stepped down below, then reappeared on deck with a tin of tobacco, matches, and cigarette papers. The smoky smiled and left me to it. It was one of those milestones in life that are so long remembered. Soon afterwards we all turned in. I would rather have sprawled in the old blanket upon the rolling deck and just smoked up at the clouded stars. But the captain quietly insisted on my taking a bunk below into the tiny cabin, dimly lit by a swinging lamp, crawled four of us. The Japanese were asleep in minutes. It was suffocatingly hot down there in that little walled-in den. Sweat appeared in beads upon the brown, naked forms all coiled up. Their jet black hair gleamed oily. By and by, big cockroaches came out and scuttled over their moist bodies. The howl of wind came gustily down. The companionway, a muffled roar from away back towards the reef. I wondered how Charlie was doing. Impossible to pick him up now, even if he changed his mind, which was extremely unlikely. The reef would be an inferno of crashing waters long before morning. A full hour before the first faint sun ray, the lugger was in a bustle. Murmur of tramping feet, an occasional horse order creak of the windlass, grinding of the chain, then rattle of blocks as thankfully I climbed on deck to meet the full force of a howling wind, pitch darkness out of which a bright light flashed above. Coquet too was on duty, flashing her warning to all, up rolled the misty sails, and as a Japanese sprang to the tiller, the cutter fell away. Fierce wind roared into the sails, she heeled over, then sped straight into the darkness. Again, that bright, warm light quivered above us. I smiled farewell to Koke, little friend of many lonely nights. Splendid seamen, the Japanese, the waves were mountains high, the hour so dark that not even the blackness of the island was visible. An hour later, a broad, wavering beam of light shot straight up from out of darkness. Slowly and reluctantly, the eastern sky <coughs> shivered into pink. Almost instantly, a half disk of molten gold, brightly quivering, appeared over the lugger's bows. Darkness lifted from silvered waters, violently tossing. Quickly, the half disk rose to the full and hung clear of the sea. Its dancing rays kissed gold into the foam of waves that came rising to the lugger's bows. The sun was up. The black boys marked approval by laughing jokes and a tribal sea song as one of them lit the galley fire. Astern was the peak of Howick Island, Island, rising sheer from the sea. How different the islands looked now, with the sun turning gold to the grassy peak. It appeared almost romantic. Gladly I watched it grow smaller and smaller. After breakfast, the crew squatted lazily, gossiping on deck, while ever ready to leap to the captain's sharp orders for the constantly recurring tacking. We anchored by an island again that night, and next day saw us tacking down the long coastline. Any peoples lived there, and the captain casually waved an arm towards the dim ranges of our big, empty peninsula. Oh yes, some big towns in there, plenty people, plenty more coming soon. Farming men from England. This peninsula, very big country, only very few your countrymen live north of Cooktown. 
Why, there are a good many there now we are pushing out. Many men are now taking up farms, thousands more now coming out from England. First time I hear these men in plenty, said the captain thoughtfully, how long these Englishmen's come. Their first boat should be in Brisbane now. Many steamers are following. We shall soon fill up Cape York Peninsula with Australians and Englishmen. The captain finished his cigarette in silence. As we gazed at the big empty peninsula, it held barely 200 cattlemen, sandalwood, getters, and prospectors, yet gold and minerals and iron were there, a well-watered country with excellent cattle land. They killed the poor old turtle. I felt sorry for my miserable fellow voyager, but he provided tasty soup and ju juicy steaks for every man aboard. During the trip, I was treated as an honored guest. The best of everything was put before me. The following day we tacked close to two luggers sailing north. Could you lay to close behind one and hail her? asked the skipper. I'd like to tell them about my mate. They might be able to land him food should the wind die down. Easy that do, replied the captain confidently, and with perfect maneuvering he present presently brought the lugger within easy hailing distance of the vessel. She was a Burns F Philip Perler. Japanese aboard, as usual, spoke good English. I shouted to the captain Charlie's predicament and asked him to land the flour and meat and tea and tobacco and any other suitable items he could spare. He shouted back a promise to do so if possible, and the vessels fell away. A week later, he kept his promise, even to landing a tent. On the fifth morning after a glorious sunrise, the white signal station stood out upon Grassy Hill. We came to anchor in the mouth of the Endeavor River within a hundred yards of where Captain Cook beached his vessel so many years ago. The Japanese doffed their lava lavas and donned silk shirts and European clothes, taking pains with their personal appearance. Smart men. I thanked them and their captain for rescue and courtesy. Then a black boy rowed me ashore and went straight across the street into George Walmsley's shop. Some of the boys were there as usual. They stared in amazement. My heavens, it's Jack, exclaimed George, the wild man of Borneo. Where have you come from? Quickly I explained. They laughed hilariously when I gazed into a looking glass. We thought you and Charlie must have taken to the mainland in a nigger's canoe months ago, said George. The skipper passed your way but saw no signal like You'd arranged. I signaled all right, did nothing else for hours every day. Charlie may have arranged for some other signal, I don't know. Here, put me into your barber's chair quick and lively, then I'll use your bathroom while you are choosing me a suit of ready maids. I want to feel civilized. That afternoon, I had an interview with the sergeant of police and explained about Charlie and his lack of supplies, his ill health, and particularly about his leaving his scope and chemicals behind. This led to the police sailing a cutter to the island, by then the lugger had landed stores for Charlie. He refused to leave, but got the police vessel to bring his wolfram back with an order for more stores. Eventually he did leave the island, returned to Cooktown, and later went back up the peninsula again looking for gold. After leaving the police station, I strolled around to the warden's office and there officially signed over my share of the island to Charlie. I had to have the matter finally settled. Then, then feeling wonderfully fit and ready to start life all over again, I walked eagerly through the town in search of my old mate, Dick.